This week's episode of Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is brought to you by the Gradient Podcast Network. Sounds Good is one of the launch shows of the Gradient Podcast Network. Check out their other podcasts like In Case You Missed It, It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's a Podcast, and Animalators at gradient.is. That's gradient.is. Hey, you guys, welcome to this week's episode of Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey. I'm Brandon Harvey. (laughs) Today, I'm so excited to be talking to Ruthie Lindsay. Aside from being one of the sweetest people I have ever met, Ruthie is a talented speaker, designer, and stylist. She's been hired to make things look beautiful for Kinfolk, Warby Parker, Free People, Better Homes and Gardens, Lincoln, and Mercedes. You've probably seen her work on the internet and not even realized it. And get this, Taylor Swift shot all of her album artwork for her album Red in Ruthie's house. In her house, like just no big deal. (laughs) Ruthie has an incredibly powerful story of overcoming pain and heartbreak, and I can't wait for you to giggle along with us. Here we go. So, Ruthie, <laughs> Ruthie, we're Hi. in the studio right now. We're in Nashville. I caught you right before you're like leaving to LA. You're always going somewhere new and somewhere exciting. Um, oh. And so, I'm just so excited to have you here and Thank to get to talk you. with you. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. This is, I mean, you were at the top of my list for people I wanted to have on the show. So, this oh. is an honor for me. It's super humbling. Thank you. Um, I just want to jump straight into things. Yeah. So the very first time that you and I met, um, I came over to your house yeah. for dinner and a dance party. Yes. And your house is classic, classic Ruthie <laughs> style. Um, and your house is absolutely beautiful. Aww. Just so stunning. Thank You've you. You've got a real art for making things beautiful. And we did dinner, we did a dance party, but one of, and you like shared your story, which is so amazing. And, and we're going to get to that, which is so fun. Um, but one of the most notable things from your house is that I sat in the chair that Taylor <laughs> Swift sat on for her album artwork from Red. Um, yeah. so, so Taylor Swift photographed her album cover and her like whole album artwork, uh, at your house. Yeah. How did that happen? I what know, the? The most random. It wasn't actually that home. We sold the house that we um, they did that shoot in. But yeah, it was just so random. I feel like it's such a Nashville thing because everyone kind of knows each other. And um, the girl that was doing the photos for the cover um, was then able to find a location for some reason. And so she had asked a mutual friend of ours who also is a real estate agent because she knows she sees homes every day. And she was like, do you know of anyone? Here's kind of the look we're going for. And she gave her my name. So the photographer and the producer came to my house and took photos and sent it to the label. And for some crazy reason, they chose my house and it was like the most fun oh my goodness it was so she was precious I mean just the sweetest most adorable thing and we had so much fun and my (laughs) nieces thought it was like the coolest thing that ever happened in life which it was it was so fun so we were so excited that's so great first of all I feel like that kind of just describes the way that I see your life sometimes it's kind of serendipitous and random and filled with beauty and it's super cool um, part of like a huge part of your of your work in your job that you kind of do at this point is that you style. Yeah. Uh, you you do styling. Yeah. Like I I almost don't even know what that means. Right. Like, can you break down <laughs> a little point. bit about like what your work is, but yeah. then also like what your philosophy is behind the styling work totally. that you do? Yeah. I mean, it's so fun for me because it looks different all the time. Like my jobs never look the same, which for my personality actually works really well because I'm kind of ADD and all over the place and I get excited about so many different things. So um, a lot of times with styling, that'll be like for photos or um, I do a lot of the producing for like campaigns, like holiday campaigns. Like I did Charity Waters holiday campaign and like um, a lot of brands will reach out to um, style photos for their campaigns or whatever it is that they're doing at the moment. 
And then I do a lot of stuff with Instagram, too. Like, brands will hire me to show how maybe I would wear or style their product. Um, And then I also do a lot of styling of events, which that's probably one of the things that I feel the most passionate about. Just because, like, I love bringing people together. That's one of my most favorite things ever. And I love bringing people and being like, oh, man, you need to know this person because y'all would just love each other and y'all could create something so beautiful together. Or y'all would just be, like, the dearest of friends. Or, And I honestly think that... That's such a huge part of like with the production and styling stuff, even for photos. It's like I'm just a fortunate enough just to know these people that do the most amazing things, but and are so crazy talented. But then my friends just make me look way better at my work than I actually am because they're so good at what they do. And and I'm lucky enough to like know who they are and know what they do. And I think one of my gifts is seeing other people's gifts and seeing who would create something beautiful together. So, um, yeah, and doing events and like bringing just making an environment that's conducive to like connection and for people to feel like cared for and like the train trip that we did that was like the most exciting thing that I've ever gotten to be a part of and kind of creating this environment where it's like conducive to people connecting and creativity and where it felt really homey but then also just like warm and inviting and I always joke and say I want it to feel like a big old hug you know and I was I was just about to say that I was gonna say that train trip that we took uh like you and I like boarded an Amtrak train yeah. that went across the country with this yeah. community of creative people, yeah. um, which is so random. They basically said, hey, Ruthie, here's a few train cars. Make them beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And you like decorated them and designed them. And you created an experience for these creative people yeah. to feel like they're part of a big warm hug. Like that's yeah. it, it's that was perfect. The hope. Oh, thank you. It was like... The hardest I've probably ever worked on any project and the longest, but it was like the most rewarding and beautiful. And just I felt so honored to get to be a part of it. And the people that came together were just so magical. And I feel like we just like we're all able to connect in such a beautiful way. We all just adored each other. It was so special. I loved it so much. Okay, so tell me, you're just like, like positive and optimistic. And you've got this beautiful eye for creativity and design. Um, and you're just like so loving and happy. And what was your, what was your childhood like? Like what were those years that formed you? Like what, what created this Ruthie? Uh, Well, I mean, I think there's been a lot of things that have come about, but I mean, I think the groundwork was, I was just really fortunate to grow up in a really amazing home and a really beautiful community. And I never once doubted that I was loved. And I think now as an adult, I see how rare that is and what a gift that is. Like my parents and my older brothers told me every day and they would praise me, but not just for like physical things. Like they would just praise like who my heart was and um, and celebrated who I was as a human. And I think my disposition is also just kind of a kind of happy when my mom yeah. said I was just a really happy baby and I just smiled a lot and um I don't know. I think that's a bit of just my disposition um, by nature. But then, you know, a lot of things happen. I know we'll kind of get into it, but like hard life stuff happened. And I kind of I've also learned um, how to find joy in the midst of really hard, broken things, because I I lived a large amount of my 20s. Um, I lived in bed from health problems and I wasn't happier or excited about life. You know, let's back up a little bit. So. Uh, I've heard your story before. Yeah. You describe your early life as pretty, uh, almost like drama free, just totally. very low key. Yep. Um, until high school. Yes. Yeah. So I, I mean, I was just really fortunate. Like life was pretty good. And I was honestly just really clueless. I just thought people were generally happy people and everyone's life was kind of good. And I did not have a clue. I had no idea what was going on in the real world. And um, that kind of came to a pretty screeching halt. I was um, a senior in high school and I pulled out in front of an ambulance and he hit me on my car door going like 65 and I broke some ribs and they punctured my lungs. My lungs collapsed, my spleen ruptured, and then I broke the top two vertebrae in my neck, C1 and C2. I had about a 5% chance to live and a 1% chance to walk. But the amazing thing was the uh, ambulance driver who hit me uh, actually saved my life. And wow. like we know I wouldn't have lived if it had not been for him. And it was my fault. Like, um, 
so he saved my life. I was on life support a long time. And um, back then, after I was, like, stable, they took wire um, and fused it with bone from my hip and wrapped it around my neck. To um, That's just how they did it back in the day. Um, and then, you know, I was in the hospital for, like, a month, and it was traumatic and really scary and hard. But then I kind of went back to life as normal after that. I didn't have a whole lot of repercussions. I didn't have a whole lot of residual effects. And all of my scars are hidden by my clothing and by my hair. And so by looking at me, you'd know nothing happened. So I kind of went back to life like nothing had happened. And I, it felt like when I would talk about it, it almost be like in the third person because I didn't really see effects from it for a long, I mean, for probably like seven years. Um until I started all of a sudden, literally out of nowhere, I started having this crazy like shooting pain up my neck that would shoot and I would literally like drop to my knees and I would feel like I was either going to like vomit or black out or like I would have these crazy migraines and it just started happening wow. pretty where, often. Where were you living at this point? So at that point, I mean, I went to school, I went to college, graduated, moved to Nashville, got a job. And everything was just kind of fine during that yes, time. Yes, everything was fine. I was just, again, just happy-go-lucky. Like if I danced too much, I'd get sore. But like, <laughs> I mean, genuinely, genuinely. Like, I mean, you dance hard, so it I makes sense. I dance real hard, always. I love it so much. But yeah, I um, I moved to Nashville. I met... Um, my very first boyfriend, and we ended up getting married like 10 months after we met, um, started our lives and kind of started everything. Everything looked really great. Like we were just excited. We bought a house in East Nashville and I toured with him a lot. Um, and probably about a year into our marriage is when the pain started. And it was like scared the you know what out of me. It was, it was really scary. And then we started a very long process of going to bazillion doctors and um, lots of films and every time they would uh, do like a CAT scan this black spot would come back on my film and they would look at everything around it and they'd be like oh that's the wire from the mach- um, your fusion interacting with the magnet in the machine everything around it looks fine were you at all like were you worried about that oh, was, spot no like, I didn't know you're just like worry. whatever yeah I just trusted the doctors I didn't know to be worried about it or to say well look and see what's under that spot this is you know and we would try all these therapies and nothing helped and my pain was just getting worse. And this went on for years and years. They started me on pretty heavy pain medication. I was just like in survival mode. It was so dark mm. and so scary. And and I mean, I don't think none of us are created knowing how to handle chronic pain. We're not meant to be in pain every minute, you know. Yeah. And so I didn't know how to handle it. And I handled it really, really poorly. And I, I shut down and I checked out and I isolated. And I started. Is that kind of what happens to a lot of people? Yes. Is that because that's just. Yeah. Like we just like what's the opposite of chronic pain? Um, so like acute pain would be okay. would be like when you break your ankle or if you sprain your toe or something, you need to rest it. And you think that you kind of need to take it easy and rest. But like with chronic pain, it's not going to go away. I mean, every morning when I wake up, it's going to still be there. And yeah. so to learn how to live despite it and even though it's still there. Um, but I you weren't there yet. No, I wasn't even close. I lived literally in my bed. I watched the grossest amount of television you could ever, ever imagine. I mean, repulsive amount of television. And I just like checked out on life for the most part. And it was super depressing. And I can't even imagine how hard it was for my spouse. I mean, that would be just devastating, you know, so hard and so difficult. And um, he did the best he knew how to do, you know, and we just, it felt pretty hopeless for a good long time. So it was really hard. Um, And finally, after like five years, a doctor was like, well, I can't tell you what's going on until I see what's under that spot. And so like this $50 x-ray showed that one of the wires had broken and pierced into my brainstem. Oh, wow. And I'm apparently the only person in the world that's ever had that. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was crazy and so scary and so dark and such a just... I was scared out of my mind and we knew that I had to get it out. But, um, was that, what was that moment like when uh, you were, when they, when he told you what was going on, was there relief because you knew what was happening or was it, was it the opposite of that? It was panic. 
absolute mm. pain. I definitely have some PTSD around doctors and it was utter panic. Like I was scared out of my mind and I kind of just shut down. And they basically said, if you don't remove, you should be paralyzed right now. If you don't remove it, you will be paralyzed. But the surgery itself was super high risk of paralysis and no one had done it before. And so it's not like we could go off a doctor with experience, you know? And so I was just, I literally felt just traumatized and I totally shut down. My brothers are both in the medical field, so they kind of took over. And so, um, yeah, they started sending my films to all these neurologists, all these orthopedic surgeons, and they all said the same thing, like, you have to get it removed. But they all had different ideas of how to go about doing it, because literally there was just not, no one had done it. Um, So it was just so, so scary. I was scared out of my mind, for sure. And so you move forward, and you decided to get the surgery. Yeah, we. Knew what was it the time a... be- between those two times, like yeah. between finding out that you needed it and actually moving so forward? So it was this kind of crazy season. It was, oh man. So probably less than two weeks later, um, insurance wasn't going to cover it because it was a pre-existing condition. And like two weeks later, my dad, I called him Papa. He was coming to visit me, and he um, had told my godfather, and my mom, that he was going to tell me like we could we would sell our farm if we needed to, so that I could have this surgery that the farm I grew up on and the night before he was coming to visit me he ended up falling down a flight of stairs and ended up passing from brain damage and so it was just this like crazy traumatic few weeks like I was getting piled on oh my gosh like I felt like it was like I was living in I I remember like laying in my bed and I would like pinch myself so hard because I'd be like, I would like bring blood to the surface because I I was just like, you have to be dreaming. This cannot be real, you know? And we, um, oh yeah, it was crazy. But one of the beautiful things that came out of that, like my godfather ended up setting up this medical fund in my dad's honor and people just came out of the woodworks because my dad was like one of the most magnetic, like that, what you're describing of like the people you want to interview, that was my dad times 800. Like he was, I always knew what I was going to get. He was the jolliest, most joyful, hilarious, but also just like really solid person. And like every time when we leave his presence as kids, he'd say, I love you so much. Remember your manners and always look out for the little guy. And that was his thing. Like he wanted us to see the people that others would miss and like love them and take care of them, you know, and that's what he did. And so literally when that medical fund was started up, um, people came out of the woodworks being like, your dad bought my prom dress. Your dad paid my tuition. Your dad fixed my roof. Your dad paid my rent. Your dad sent me to school. Like it went on and on and on. And like my dad had just loved people so well that this crazy amount of money was raised in his honor. And it was like the most humbling, beautiful thing just to see the way that he had touched so many people's lives and affected so many hearts. And just, it was, it was incredible. And just this really beautiful thing to experience in the midst of like a really, really traumatic and scary um, time to just see that he still took care of me, you know, like even after he passed away, like he still took care of me by love the way he loved other people. He took care of me. And it's, it's not even that he just took care of you, but I mean, I know you and you've probably heard this before, but like, and I don't know your dad, but like part of like the way that you're describing him is absolutely how I would describe you as somebody who is just caring for people, looking out for the little guy. Like it's, that's beautiful. And so I, I think that that, I don't know, that's just so powerful that, uh, obviously the impact that he made on people's lives and then them paying that forward with you and paying for everything. But, uh, but I can see it in your character. Oh, well, that's like, that makes me want to cry. That's like, the greatest compliment I could ever receive. If I'm a tenth of that man, then what man? What a what a huge what a huge honor. He's he was really special. I think the thing like he he was just magnetic, you know, and he just drew people in. He wanted to be in his presence because it felt so good, mm-hmm. and he just made everyone feel so special. Like every single person felt so special in his presence, and um, and I see it in my brothers. They're the exact same way, and it's. It's just a beautiful thing. And then I see it in their kids. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, one of my nieces, like, we call her the Pied Piper. Like, kids just follow her around. She's just this little light of just brightness. I'm like, my dad. Like, I see him in her, you know. And it's so – it's really a beautiful – he left quite the legacy, you know. It's pretty amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. And so 
And so you move forward. Yeah. You got the surgery. Yeah. So we ended up, I mean, the lucky thing about having a freak medical thing is doctors are like chomping at the bit to work on you. So I was being pursued by a lot of pretty well-known doctors. And I ended up choosing Mayo Clinic. And they um, took bone out of my other hip. And this time they um, fused it with like six titanium screws and um, removed the wire. And, you know, it was... um, incredibly difficult it's extremely hard and I thought I knew pain but I guess I didn't have a clue of how much it could actually be um but I mean I left walking which was like they told me going into it they're like we don't know we hope that this will help relieve your pain but the reason we're doing this is because you will not be walking eventually if we do not remove this wire but hopefully pain relief will come you know and it was interesting after the surgery the um shooting did stop which was amazing but I ended up getting a ton of nerve damage um so my pain actually changed um like my now uh my right side is like on fire all the time um and like the best way I know how to describe it is like one time my right foot was standing in red ants and I didn't know it. And I ended up getting like tons and tons of red ant bites up my leg. But I didn't know it. my brother had to like yell at me to move because it feels like more of the same. Like that's what it feels like all the time. So once again, I came home and like I was just handling pain really poorly. I was on tons of medication and I felt really depressing. Like I still live my life in bed because I, I just I hurt all the time. So I was like, I guess this is going to be my life. I'm just going to live in my bed and I kind of just gave up in a lot of ways and it felt so hopeless and very depressing. And I was just on the dumbest, crazy amount of medication that you could even comprehend. Like would probably if you took a third of it right now, you would like be in the emergency room. But I'd built up, you know, seven years Mm -hmm. of taking it. And so finally, I mean, probably like a year and a half after that surgery, I hit the biggest wall that you could ever imagine. And I literally had like a nervous breakdown, like a literal nervous breakdown. I knew that my marriage was coming to an end and I felt that coming and it scared me to death and also like broke my heart. And then I had caught this crazy bacterial infection while I was in the hospital for um, another surgery, a little minor surgery um, that made me so sick called C. diff. And I literally thought I was going to die. It was like the most ill I'd ever been in my life. And I just, I hit a wall and I, It was the scariest, darkest, but also one of the best things that ever happened to me because I ended up moving home. Um, My husband at the time was on on tour and I I kept ending up in the emergency room. Like I literally couldn't take care of myself. I was so sick. And my brother, my family kind of stepped in and that's when they realized how bad it really was. And I was so mortified. I was so embarrassed. And but it was like it was one of the best things that ever happened because I hit such a wall and had such a mental breakdown that I was like, whatever I'm doing is not working and I need to change everything, Mm -hmm. literally everything. Yeah. You kind of needed to find that limit before you could hit refresh. Exactly. Like you hear like, I mean, I know it's different, but it's the same mentality. Like you hear about like drug addicts and alcoholics having to hit rock bottom. Like I hit my rock bottom. It was literally like, I felt like my life was over. And I remember having a conversation with my brother and he's like, babe, you can lay in your bed and hurt all the time. Or you can like go out and be with people and love on people and hurt. Like, what's your better option? I'm like, duh, you know, like, (laughs) oh my gosh. And I also, I mean, I was still hurting every second. So I was like, this medication is only freaking with my mind. Like it is messing with me really bad. And so with my family's help, I decided to wean myself off of seven years of medication. Everything? Everything. Wow. Literally everything. And I did it in like four months. I did it too soon, but I just was like, I was ready for it to be done. Like I was literally like, I want this out. And this it was beautiful because as I started doing it, probably like two months in, I started, my mind started feeling like me again. Mm. And up to that point, like I had just like led with my pain and my pain had been the thing that like I was kind of, I let myself be defined by. So that's how everyone else saw me. And I just kind of decided to like think differently and act differently. And I remember um, like two months in when I would like, I was, you know, halfway done weaning myself off everything. I had this like image of myself walking out of the um, eye doctor's office when I was in like second grade and being like, oh, 
mom, like, look at the sky, like, look at the birds. And that's how I felt again when I was off of these drugs. Like, I felt clear and I felt like myself. And I'm such a feeler, but I was mostly just feeling the heavy, broken things. And then all of a sudden, I was able to, like, see the beauty. And I was choosing to see all the beauty around me in people and experiences and, like, the life around me and, and focusing on it and, like, relishing in it and and it was like it was healing it was like healing for my soul and my heart and you know my body still hurt all the time but it was different because I wasn't focusing like when you lay in bed that's all you think about is how you're hurting all the time but when you're out being with people and connecting with people and like loving on people and doing work that you love you know you're not thinking about it it's not at the forefront of your thoughts and so it was scary but also like this really beautiful season and that was three years ago wow yeah yeah it's pretty incredible i'm so thankful it was like the best decision i ever made in my life that's amazing and and you and I met maybe three years ago, like maybe a little bit short of three years ago. Yeah. Um, I heard your story the first time we met and then I like maybe read it again somewhere else. But between that time, I actually totally forgot your story oh. and I didn't realize that you were living with this pain and mm-hmm. because you just don't, it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't define you. It's not who you are. Yeah. And, um, I love that. Thank you for telling me that. I love, <laughs> I love that. I, I, you know, for the longest time, because I led with it when I'd see people, they'd be like, how are you doing? How's your back? You know, and I'm a, and I found a sense of like, it justified me living in bed. I found comfort in their sympathy in this kind of gross, twisted way mm. because I would found myself identifying with my pain. And so it justified when they felt sorry for me or didn't re- expect anything from me. Like it justified me being a bad friend, being a bad spouse, wasting my life, essentially. Like that was almost like validation to me in some creepy, twisted, not even consciously, but in some weird way. And for me, it's like the great. I love that. Like people don't ask me about my pain anymore. And I love that so many people don't even know if they don't know my story, they don't know that that's my existence, you know, like because pain now is just a piece of my story. It doesn't define me. Like I hope when when people like leave me or leave my presence, like I hope they feel connected and they feel special and they feel cared for and not like sorry for me, you know, like that's gross. I don't want to to feel sorry for like there's no reason to, you know. So, yeah, it's it's a total just shift in mentality, I think. Like and I I've thought about recently a lot like we teach people how to see us, you know, and how, what you lead with is how they see you. And like if you lead with like insecurity and pain and brokenness, that is exactly how people will see you. But if you lead with like life-giving like joy and you care about who the other person is and you're interested in their life and you you care about them like that that's just not even in the cards. Like they, they don't think about that stuff. Like they see you for who you are and your personality and not like these broken pieces of you. I love that. I don't even know what else to say to that. <laughs> I just love that. Um, and it's so true. Like these, you get to decide what defines you. And and you've done a really, really great job of that. At what point did you decide to almost start telling your story? Yeah. I would imagine that that kind of goes along with the same thing of choosing to define what your story is. Yeah, a lot shifted. So um, I found myself going through a divorce and that was a really heavy, heartbreaking thing. Um, Luckily, I had already weaned myself off of everything and I was in a really good mental space, but it was incredibly difficult and incredibly hard. And at that point, I had like I mean, really, my job up to that point had been like survival. Like I had been such a nightmare for so many years. And then I also did help manage his work stuff. And so after a 10 year relationship, I found myself single for the first time and I had no form of income. Because you hadn't been doing no, all the styling, no, design stuff. No, I didn't even know I was good at that stuff. I had like when people would ask me if I was creative, I'd be like, no, I do not have a creative bone in my body. And I genuinely thought that I did not grow up in a creative home. I'd never taken an art class. I never studied anything. I had no experience but other people had like seen my home and like had complimented and told me 
that I was good at it. Like my community told me I was good at it. And I had to kind of trust their words. I didn't have the luxury of fear. Like up to that point, like after the Taylor Swift thing happened and like I decorated my house and people had seen some photos, when people would ask me to help them with theirs, I'd always said no because I was too scared. I was scared how my body would handle it. And I was too fearful because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll disappoint them, you know? And so after that relationship ended, I like, I did not have the luxury of fear. You're like I don't have a choice. Yeah. I was and like, this I have is the to pay only my thing bills. that people tell me I'm good at. Yeah. Literally, I had to pay my bills. And I was fortunate enough to be in this Nashville community of the most incredible humans. And they spoke life into me. And I almost just kind of walked into it. Like, I was like, okay, so you told me I'm good at decorating. I'm just going to say yes. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I'm just going to say yes. And I'm scared out of my mind. But like my friends, like um, Amy Stroop and Mary Hooper, like they hired me to help style the cover of Amy's first record. And I was like, I'd never done styling work in my life. I'd never been on a professional photo shoot in my life, like with me being a part of it, you know? And I was just like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. And I am I was so always super upfront. I'm like, I've never done that, but yes, I would love to. And I'm so honored that you want to have me be a part. And so a lot of that kind of stuff started happening. And then I started an Instagram account. And oh my gosh, if you go back and look at my photos, they're oh, the It's worst. hilarious. Oh. Everybody go do it. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> It's so bad. They are the worst. I mean, literally the worst photos you can imagine. And I posted all the time, all the time. And I would just write these like books. Like, it was so bad. But for some reason, people started that didn't know me. People that didn't know me started following along, Absolutely. which was so bizarre to me because I'm like now cracking up. I'm like, it was literally the worst photos. And just, <laughs> oh my gosh, so funny. So, But there, I, was, some, there was something in them. Yeah. Because I, I remember seeing your Instagram long ago. Yeah. And just like the photos. Photos, uh, like honestly, were, were bad, but like the <laughs> the stuff in the photos were fantastic, yeah, and that's thanks. that's what it was. You like you were sharing your journey, you were yeah. sharing your story, and you were sharing beauty. Yeah, um, there are just some crappy photos in the way of that, but <laughs> I love it. I didn't have a clue. I literally had no clue. I mean, that's what I feel like everything has been is like me just like walking into these random situations and saying yes, and like. I, but all of it has been this very organic. Like I was, I started posting things I was doing. Like I love flowers. Like I'm obsessed with flowers. Wildflowers are my favorite. I was just trying to focus on beauty. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go pick wildflowers and bring them to people. And I'm going to, I love bringing people together, even though I can't even cook, but I love setting tables and setting a conducive community for a uh, environment for people just to experience community and connection. Like that's like my favorite thing. So I was doing that and I was posting horrible photos of it. But for some reason, I don't know if people thought that's what I did already or if they liked the work that they saw, but people started asking me to help them do their jobs. And, and you were just saying yes. And I was just saying yes. That's something that yes. I've definitely learned to be true. Yeah. Once you learn uh, that saying no out of fear doesn't yes. do anything, right. um, saying yes feels a lot more possible. And yeah. you just start doing it. And that's when the doors open right. up. Totally. It's, that's the biggest thing. Like if yep. you just say yes, there's a lot of people out there who aren't saying yes. Right. And or putting themselves out there to yeah. even have the opportunity in the first place. Exactly. And yeah. so there's really not that many people in the world saying yes. Yeah. And that's almost what this podcast is a celebration of. Right. People who are saying yes to these things yeah. embedded deep inside of them. Yeah. So you asked, like, how I ended up sharing my story. So people that didn't know me were following me at this point. And I started getting these comments of people being like, I love your life. Like, I want your life. You live my dream life. And honestly, I would feel like I was going to vomit when I would get these comments because, A, I remember being in my bed looking on Facebook and, you know, seeing other people's lives and be like, God. And feeling so sad and so depressed because to be like, I wish I was out doing those things or playing with my children in, you know, the park or doing this, this and that and instead of laying in bed in pain all the time. And so I, the thought that my life could conjure up any of those sort of feelings for anyone else made me feel nauseous, especially because they didn't have the context of what was really going on. I'm like, there is a context for my joy and there's still a lot of really, really broken, hard things going on. And I want to give them a full scope of like, this is me choosing joy and choosing to experience life to the best that I know how in the midst of a really tough, broken season. Like I was still in pain every second and I was going through a divorce and I miss my dad every day, you know, but like I felt like it was crucial for me to be authentic and be honest to be like, you can still live a really, really beautiful life in the midst of suffering. And so I wrote everything out and I honestly like I remember hitting like 
publish and feeling, I was sitting with my friend Kate Gasway and I felt like I was going to vomit. I felt naked. I was like, oh my God, I just put everything out there, you know, and I felt exposed. But it was also like, it turned out to be one of the most beautiful and most freeing things. Cause like the things that we think will scare people away actually like draws them in. Like when people are so longing for connection and longing for authenticity and the longing just to not feel alone. And so for other people that are suffering to be like, Oh wait, I'm not the only person that feels this way. And I'm not the only person that's gone through this. Like there's something so beautiful about getting to connect with other people that are suffering and like, pain brings empathy, you know? And so now it's been like the most amazing thing because like I get to share my story, like speaking, like I've been doing a lot of more, a lot more speaking engagements and sharing my story. And I get to have this opportunity to connect with men and women that are struggling. And like, I can walk with someone that's going through relationship pain. I can walk with someone that's dealing with death. I can walk with someone that's dealing with emotional, physical, spiritual heartache, but also piggyback it with saying, but there's so much hope. Like, this is not the end of your story. There's so much hope for you. And there's so much life for you to live in the midst of this. And despite this, like, this is not going to be your defining thing. This does not, you don't have to let this. So often we do. And I think hard things can either make you, it can make you bitter or it can like make you better. It can make you a better version, you know? And and I was like, bitterness just sucks the life out of you and everyone around you. And I want to give life and I don't, I want to choose life, you know? So I got to share that and it's been so sweet and such a gift. That's amazing. Yeah. And you're, like amazing when you speak publicly, you're amazing when you when you write things down. But something that I've found to be really really cool about you is that you seem to make friends everywhere you go. Oh. And 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 I would imagine that part of the secret is just being authentic and real and helping people realize what their true identity is and what it isn't. Yeah. But can you also just like let me in on like your secret for making <laughs> friends? From you. You're like the friendliest like everyone second loves friendliest <laughs> <laughs> if anything, but probably a lot lower on that Come list. On. But oh. like, what's what's your secret for making friends? Oh gosh, you know, honestly, Brandon, like, I was the worst student that you could ever imagine. Like, I was the worst, and like, people would talk about what they were good in at school, and I would be like. They'd be like, I'm really good at English, but I'm terrible at science. I'd be like, I suck at all of it. The only thing I'm good at is playground. Like, that's it. That's all I'm good at. That's like my one gift. And I don't know. I think I think a lot of it's just by nature. Like, I've always just loved people and I'm excited. But like, people excite me. And like, that's become like such a healing thing for me because, you know, I'm never going to wake up not in pain. But what I've learned is my first inclination was to lay in bed and just suffer in silence and hurt. But when I'm out with people and connecting with people and hearing their passions and, you know, hearing their stories, like I I'm not thinking about it. And I it excites me more than anything else, like walking even into well, like where we are today and seeing all these faces like that energizes me. I that's like I'm an extrovert through and through. I like get so excited about people. Surprise. (laughs) Surprise. No surprise there. But I think part of it maybe is like, like when people ask me about how do you get these like design jobs? I'm like, honestly, I don't have a whole lot of experience. I mean, I've gained experience the last two years, but like, I think my best piece of advice is like be someone that other people want to be around and care about them, like genuinely care about them. And that goes further. Like, when you meet someone like that nature, we're selfish beings and you want to talk about yourself and you want to talk about your experience. You want to talk about your feelings, but like to like make a conscious decision to like care about them and ask questions. And like, I think this sounds like the cheesiest thing ever, but like, I really try to focus, like when I see something beautiful in someone, even if it's a stranger, I tell them, or I I, I seek to like tell them. And I'm like, dude, like it might, they might feel a little odd, but no one's ever bombed by a compliment. Like, Ever. Like, I think when we choose to, like, look for people's gifts and if you see them, like, speak it out loud and tell them. Like, other people told me I was creative. I didn't know. And I think a lot of times, like, we're so blinded by our own insecurities and our own brokenness and our own stuff. We get so muddled down by our own stuff that when other people speak life-giving stuff into us, it's like, 
oh, you see that in me? Like, it, it it's life-giving. And I think, I don't know, it, it draws people in. Like, people are just longing to, like, feel seen and to feel cared for and to feel loved. And I don't do it so that they'll be my friend. Like, that's not the, the end goal. It's not like, I need some new friends today. I'm going to go make some new friends. And so compliment some people. Like, that, it's not this, like, it's not like that. I, but I think... Um, Maybe that's I honestly don't know. <laughs> no, that's that's a fantastic answer. I love that. And I actually my next question that I had written down, <laughs> uh, I'm not really doing these in order or anything, but something else I'd written down is like when I see you, you're always coming back with like a story of something amazing that happened. And amazing things are happening to you all the time, but those are never the stories that you tell me. You're always telling me the amazing stories of somebody else. Oh. And so, I was just wondering like what is an amazing story of somebody else that like happened this week or is like about to happen? Like, I want to just hear you celebrate somebody because that's one of my favorite things about you. <laughs> I mean, I love that. Like literally everything you're saying, I, I see all of those things in you. Like you're like the most celebratory of any other human. Of in, Like literally that is like one of your, there's so many gifts, but like I think one of your greatest gifts that I love, like I love reading when you tell stories of people like on your Instagram because it you see people, you truly see people and you see their gifts and you see what they bring into the world. And so I love that you're doing this because it's a, just another extension of you telling, you're a storyteller, but it's always lifting other people up. It's just beautiful. Like I love you and Sammy both. Like I'm like, oh my gosh, those two together are just going to like bring light and joy and goodness to the world. Like it's just incredible because y'all are just like the brightest lights ever. Well, um, so I wasn't going to say this, yeah. but I'm about to say you're in my story. No, no like, what? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. I'm honored. But now I have to have Chad cut that whole thing no, out. <laughs> Chad, listen to me. This is Ruthie speaking. Do not cut that out. That is the truth. And that is just absolute utter truth. Like genuinely, like I, I, th- I think about that. Like I love how you celebrate those around you. You celebrate all walks of life. It can literally be like, I remember one time reading your caption of like a taxi or an Uber driver that was bringing you to a freaking hotel. And like you ask questions and you care about them. And of course they just fall in love with you because you're amazing and feel so cared for and feel special. Like you make people feel special and seen and heard. And like, I don't know. I feel so honored. Like it, it inspires me and it excites me and it makes me want to do that more. And I think that's like what our gifts hopefully could do for other people. It's like, see, that's such a good reminder. I need to go speak that stuff over people. And like, I don't know. It's it's really, it's beautiful. Like, I love that you're a part of this community now and like that I get to like watch that in person. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, Thank you so much, Ruthie. <laughs> that that really means a lot, especially coming from you. Now we're kind of at the part of the show where uh, I love to just ask a few really hands-on yeah, practical questions. Totally. Um, and, and my first question for you is, uh, like, how would you describe the kind of person you most admire in the world? You've talked about a lot of people you admire. You talked about your dad. Yeah. Uh, you talked about <laughs> me, which yes. is which is embarrassing, um, yeah. but like a special kind of yeah. person in the world. How do you describe that? I, I totally, I love that question because I, I look around at like my friends mm-hmm. and uh, I'll probably start crying talking about them. But like I have the most incredible people surrounding me and I feel like there's this common thread that goes through all of them because they're very different types of humans, but they are all see people and care deeply about people and a lot of times they're like creatives and they're creating beautiful things but like the thing that's like this common thread is like they celebrate others and genuinely like see them like I think about Shoni and like she's such an introvert I'm such an extrovert but like you never see her without someone like sitting across from someone and them having these beautiful in-depth conversations and them feeling really seen and really cared for. And like, I know anytime I bring my best friend Amber to a party or anything, she will notice the person that feels a little bit awkward or feels a little bit uncomfortable. And she will make a point to be by that person and loving that person and inviting them in and introducing them to other people. And like my best friend Jed, he's like the exact same way. He's the most magnetic human. He loves people so well. Like, all walks of life, every type of human that you can imagine feels like that's my best friend. And he makes every person feel so validated and so special. And so I think that is like, maybe it's selfish because they make me feel so special too. 
<laughs> so maybe I choose my friends <laughs> selfishly. They just, they love me so well. And it's like the most humbling. Like, I feel so honored to be a part of this community of friends that like, they are the most loving humans that I know. And they affect other people's lives in the most beautiful way. So I think, I mean, the core is like loving people and seeing people. And that's how, I mean, that's how my dad is. Like, that's how my brothers are. Like, they they make everyone feel comfortable. That's perfect. I love that. Yeah. The people that you most admire in the world make everybody feel comfortable. They yeah. see people and yeah. they make them feel comfortable. They make you feel at home. Like, at in their home. presence feels like home. That's what I, like, I when I was, like, trying to explain Jed to someone yesterday, I'm like, just sitting across from him feels like home. You can be in, like... South America or any random place across the country. I've like traveled with them all over, but like being in his presence feels like home. It's beautiful. Question number two. Yes. <laughs> um, what are you consuming right now? Like, is there anything that you're reading or listening to? Um, gosh, you know, I so bad. Somebody asked me the other day in an interview about <laughs> like, what magazines do you read? What blogs do you read for inspiration? What? And I was like, I, I feel like such a fraud, but like genuinely for me, like the thing that inspires me the most is people. And so I I sit across from people and ask a lot of questions. And like, I feel like that's where I've learned the most. Like that's where I glean the most. Like that's where I, that's what inspires me. I'm so relational. So like sitting in my house and reading a book, I got, it kind of, like, I feel, I was like, I love it. And it's so important. And like, usually the only time I listen to like podcasts or anything is when I'm in the car. If I'm not with someone, if I'm with someone, we're usually talking or listening to really inappropriate rap music. That happens a lot That's too. something that I know for sure yes! is true about you. Yes. <laughs> It's so true. I love it so much. We'll be dancing and you'll just be belting out all the lyrics <laughs> to some song. I'm the dirtiest words. I'm like, I just pretend like I, I just block out what they're actually talking about because I'm like, is this the best thing to dance to it's ever? It's so good. It's, it's so, so good. It's so inappropriate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that's like, I don't know. That's probably not a very cultured answer. I mean, no. I. And the other thing is you're a creator. Like you're yeah. constantly creating things. Mm-hmm. And I found that the the creators who I most admire maybe consume the least. Hmm. And that's interesting. And it's it's interesting. And and like I love my binge watching of Netflix shows. So oh, yeah. like I'm I'm all about that. But sure. Uh, but I love that you're like, I'm intentional about what I'm gonna consume and yeah. and what I'm gonna consume as people and their yeah. stories. Well and honestly it's not that I can listen, I can binge watch something on Netflix like the best of them, but like for the longest time when I lived in my bed, like literally all I did was watch crap television. And so then I was like, I just don't wanna have a TV in my house because that's my go to. That's my escape. Like some people go to alcohol or go to I mean, I don't know, food or whatever. Like people have their, we all have the thing that helps us escape, you know, reality. And mine was entertainment, like TV and trashy TV, like reality TV, the worst TV. And I know for me that that's still in me. Like when I'm hurting really bad, I want to lay in my bed on my heating pad and watch really horrible, like the Real Housewives. I'm not even kidding. It's like the worst. (laughs) But I try, like that doesn't feel life-giving for me. That that only like sucks energy and life out of me or just feels kind of depressing. And so I really like, I think we're also so spoiled because we're in this crazy creative community. Like my friends are the most inspiring humans to me ever. Like I look at like what they're creating and what they're doing and like it, it blows me away and it inspires me and it excites me to like create and to do, like they make me want to be better. My friends make me want to be better in all aspects. Like they make me want to be a better creator. They make me want to work harder. They make me want to like love better because they do a really great job. We all like we we try to be really, really intentional with each other. And we speak hard. Like my friends will call me on my shit, you know, which I love. And I think it's so important and so valuable. Like we speak the beautiful things, but like we've had hard conversations. And if I'm being a turd, like they will tell me. And I, I love that. I love that we have an environment that's like conducive and it's hard to do. Like I'm a pleaser and I want to make everyone happy. So like the thought of like disappointing people crushes me. But it only makes our relationships so much stronger and so much richer and so much more beautiful and authentic. And we hold each other accountable, which is a beautiful gift, you know? I love that. My my final question for okay. today is, burr, 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 burr. I love that <laughs> sound effect. In light of your story, 
what would you encourage people to do to live differently? Just one practical, tangible thing. I mean, honestly, I think to live in the posture, like a lot of times, especially at the beginning, and sometimes I still, it, it's still a reality for me, is sometimes I have to go through the motions and choose joy even when I don't feel joyful and choose life and smile even though I'm like, I'm hurting so bad and I want to crawl in the fetal position and I do not want to care about people right now. I just want to feel sorry for myself. That's my natural inclination. But I've learned there's something so beautiful in learning lessons the hard way that that brings nothing life-giving comes out of that. And so despite your circumstances, like you have to go through the motions. Like I don't, even if you don't feel like you're going to be a good friend, go seek to like love on someone and go serve people. When we get outside of ourselves, it's the most, it's the most life-giving. It's the most joyful. And at first it might be like going through the motions, but the emotions will come. Like as cheesy, you, we've heard this forever, but it's like when you smile and you people smile back at you, even if you're like hurting, it comes. Like the emotion comes. You like force yourself to go through the motions and the the feelings will come because of your action. It's like not letting our emotions define us because my emotions are selfish. My emotions are take care of you, you know, do you, do whatever is best for you. And that is – that's a lie because nothing – I mean, of course, you like you have to like take care of yourself. I'm not saying I don't know. I feel like that can be taken out of context. But like, I think by nature, we're selfish. And to learn to like try to love people and serve people despite our fleeting emotions, like, I, you know, we use love so freely. And I do it. I know I do it. I was talking to my French friend the other day. He's like, you Americans say love like 20 times a day. I love this. I love that. And he's like, if we say love, we mean it. And there is like, you are backing that word up and there's actions to back it up. So like, you know, choosing to genuinely care and love, even when you don't feel it. And, you know, when you say, okay, I'm choosing to love you, despite how my fleeting feelings feel. Like sometimes me and my friends, like, you know, we get on each other's nerves and we're punks. And, but like, what does it look like to practically love despite that and I don't know I guess just like yeah going through the motions and actions and then letting the emotions come after the fact because they will and that's what's so beautiful you know choosing joy it's a decision I mean that choosing life choosing to not be bitter choosing to like love people it's a decision it's not an emotion like it's a decision and so I think that's the thing that I feel like I've learned the most and I'm, I still fail at it all the time. And luckily I have friends that like lift me up and help me and want me to be better also. And so it's a constant decision to do that and to try to be better, you know? Yeah. Does that even make sense? No. I feel like I just rambled no. so much. <laughs> that absolutely makes sense. Okay. That's beautiful. I love that idea. I think, yeah, I think that just choosing to almost like choosing to have the emotions that you want to have and choosing to take the actions towards uh, the results you want to have. Totally. It's perfect. That's great. Well, I'm so glad that that we got to talk today and just hang out. This is great. This was such a treat. Thank I Genuinely, like, I'm so honored that you're doing this. And I love, like, I love the concept of this. I can't wait to listen to other people's journey and, like, I don't know, like, celebrating folks that are – doing neat things and that are joyful and like choosing that is it's just really exciting and the way that you're able to see that in other people is just really exciting so I'm really honored that I got to be a part of it thank you so much well thank you um if people want to follow along with your journey if they want to see what you're up to where can they do that yeah I mean probably the best way would be Instagram it's just at Ruthie Lindsay um Lindsay spelled with an e um I have a website and I don't update it very often I'm gonna update it soon because I'm doing a lot more speaking stuff so I'm gonna add a tab for that but really the daily like life stuff is just is through Instagram that would be probably the best way. And I know that I dogged on her Instagram earlier. We both did. <laughs> it was but, the worst. But it's so good now. Ruthie's Thank so fun. You. And I love following along with her life. So thank totally do that. <laughs> thank and you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show yeah. today. This is so great. And, Thanks, Brandon. And uh, I hope you make it to your flight uh, before it takes off. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Woo, woo, woo. Woo. 
Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is produced by Gradient. Find out more at gradient.is. To keep up with me in my bizarre life, follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. My username is simply at Brandon Harvey. And if you go to my website, brandonharvey.com, you can sign up for my weekly good newsletter, where I highlight five of the most hopeful things that happened in the world this past week. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you listen to podcasts so that the newest episode of Sounds Good magically shows up on your device while you sleep. And if you leave me a review on iTunes and tell a friend about the show, it would mean a lot. It really, truly helps. That's it for this week's podcast. I can't wait till next week when we'll be back to learn from another incredible person. Sound good?